Uh, I'm Junta Tang, a PhD student from Rutgers University. Um, I'm very glad to introduce the work learning and uh, evaluating graph neural network explanations based on counterfactual and uh, factual reasoning. Um, as the title says, uh, this paper is about explainable gene N. And uh, from a causal perspective, we focus on both learning and uh, evaluating the explanations of GN predictions. This topic is important for the web community uh, because graph-like data naturally exist in the web applications, um, such as in social networks and uh, sufficient networks. And the GN technique is widely used for making predictions for such data. Uh, so, uh, however, uh, it's kind of hard to explain the predictions made by the deep gene networks. Mm, so, uh, in this paper, we basically try to answer the following three questions. The first one is, what explanations are considered good explanations for GN predictions? Uh, especially considering that in the most case, nobody knows about the real ground truth explanations. And the, the second question is about the method to generate such explanations. And the, the third question is, for the generated explanations, how could we quantitatively evaluate them and the compare between different methods, especially without uh, ground truth data? So in this paper, we try to design a common framework to solve all of these problems. And we consider counterfactual reasoning and the factual reasoning. Um, this is not the first work to generate GNN explanations from a causal perspective. Uh, in fact, there are existing works learning about GNN explanations by considering either factual reasoning or counterfactual reasoning. But in this work, we think that factual reasoning and the counterfactual reasoning are not just simply different perspectives to generate explanations. Uh, they are actually complementary ideas and we should combine them together to design the system. And they are also useful not only for learning explanations, but also useful for evaluating them. Um, I'd like to use a real world biochemical example to illustrate the high level idea in this paper, since this example has no ground truth explanations by human. Um, this is a molecule taken from a chemical data set, and it is represented as a graph. The nodes are atoms and the edges are chemical bonds. And this, chem this molecule is predicted to be mutagenic. Um, in case you're not familiar with chemical, um, mutagenic means it is capable of inducing genetic mutations. And the people already know about the true reason of this mutagenicity is because it has the natural binding structure, uh, which is the nitrogen dioxide uh, connected to the carbon ring. Um, now considering using factual reasoning, what will happen if we try to generate an exp explanation for the mutagenicity? Um, methods based on factual reasoning look for a subgraph whose information is sufficient enough uh, to produce the same prediction as using the whole original graph, such as in this case, um, the subgraph with the bold edges is the explanation extracted by factual reasoning. Factor reasoning favors subgraph explanations that contain enough information to make the same prediction. But uh, at the same time, the extracted subgraph may include redundant nodes or edges and uh, not compact enough. Like in this case, um, these four edges uh, are not part of the true reason. Um, on the other hand, methods based on counterfactual reasoning seek a subgraph whose information is necessary. And if this information being removed, the prediction should be different. Uh, therefore, counterfactual reasoning only extract the most crucial information. Uh, however, because of this, counterfactual reasoning may only extract a small subset of the real explanation, such as in this case, uh, the extracted subgraph only contains three edges. These edges, if removed, will indeed break the natural binding structure. Um, and lead to a different uh, prediction. Uh, however, such an explanation doesn't cover the enough uh, and the complete information we need. Um, 
As a conclusion, to overcome the problems and to look for a balance between necessity and the sufficiency, we combine both of factual and the counterfactual reasoning to extract GNN explanations. Uh, as shown in the last figure, the counterfactual objective encourages the necessary edges being included, while the factual objective ensures that the extracted explanation contains enough information, and therefore uh, an ideal subgraph explanation can be created. Um, this is the uh, motivation of the uh, paper. And next, I'll introduce how we design the optimization problem based on the above idea. Um, I'd like to first mention that in this presentation, all the concepts, examples, and the mathematical definitions are introduced under the graph classification problem. And they can be easily generalized to the node classification task. Uh, if you're interested, you can also find it in the paper. And uh, at first, uh, suppose uh, for a given graph GK with a set of nodes and uh, edges, it is associated with an adjacency matrix A and a node feature matrix X. Uh, X consists of uh, real numbers. A pre-trained GN model will predict the estimated label for this graph, uh, taking the input of adjacency matrix and the node feature matrix. Uh, this file here represents the pre-trained parameters, which will be fixed when generating explanations. Uh, in the explainable GN problem, we try to explain why this label is being predicted. Um, is predicted uh, by generating an edge mask M and a feature mask F. Uh, when applying the mask on the original adjacency matrix and applying the uh, F mask on the original feature matrix, it will produce a subgraph as the final explanation, which is called the explanation subgraph. To design the algorithm, we first formulate the factual and the counterfactual conditions. Factual reasoning asks the question, uh, given event A already happened, will B happen? In GNN explanations, factual reasoning generates a subgraph. Uh, with this sub subgraph, the GN prediction will be the same, so that if the generated explanation satisfies factual condition, we take input of the extracted subgraph uh, into the GN model. The predicted label should be the same as taking the original graph. For counterfactual reasoning on the country asks if event A didn't happen, will B still happen? And uh, under the context of a GNN explanation, for the subgraph generated by counterfactual reasoning, uh, without this subgraph, the GN prediction should be different. Therefore, to satisfy the counterfactual condition, we use the original graph minus the exp explanation subgraph as the input, and uh, we expect the predict label to be different. Uh, however, um, uh, this, this strength of explanation is, uh, is only one aspect for a good explanation. According to Occam's reader principle, uh, if two explanations are equally effective, or we can see that they are equally strong, they both satisfy the conditions, we tend to prefer the simpler one. So here, we also mathematically define the complexity of the explanations by the non-zero values in the subgraph, uh, which is the zero norm of the edges uh, and the features masks. After optimization, the complexity should be as small as possible. And uh, we also define the explanation strength as following. From the, uh, from the factual perspective, we input the subgraph, the predicted score on the original predicted label should be large enough to satisfy the factual condition. And uh, from the counterfactual perspective, when you input the remand graph, the predicted score on the original predicted label should be small enough to satisfy the counterfactual condition. And based on the above definitions or tools, we finally are able to formulate this optimization problem, which is we try to minimize the explanation complexity. And at the same time, the explanation should, uh, should be strong enough to satisfy both the factual and the counterfactual conditions. And uh, we try to use gradient descent to solve the optimization problem to generate explanations. Uh, but but uh, uh, since both the objective part and the constraint part are not differentiable, uh, we relax the two parts and uh, to make the uh, equation optimizable by using some commonly used tricks. This is the final uh, 
uh, relax the optimization equation. We change the hard constraint of factual condition and the counterfactual condition to continuous uh, loss functions. And the, the detail about the relaxation can be seen in the paper. Uh, we have already introduced some concepts in this paper. Here is an overall review of them. We note that for a gene explanation, um, the complexity and the strength are two orthogonal concepts. A complex explan explanation may not necessarily be strong, and a simple explanation may not necessarily be weak. We are trying to find a simple but uh, strong explanation in the algorithm designing. And this table shows the relationships of the concepts in the paper. A simple, a, a simple explanation should have a small set of edges and the features. And at the same time, a strong explanation should satisfy the counterfactual and the factual conditions. Uh, so in the last part, based on the same ideas of factual and uh, counterfactual conditions, we design a metric to quantitatively evaluate the generated explanations. The designed metric doesn't require any ground truth data. The metric uh, contains two values. The first value is called PS value, which is probability of sufficiency. Uh, suppose we already generated explana explanation subgraphs for all the predictions. Intuitively, uh, PS measures the percentage of graphs whose explanation subgraph alone can keep the GN prediction on change, and therefore they are sufficient. The second value is called PN value, which is the probability of necessity. PN measures the percentage of graphs whose explanation subgraph, um, if removed, will change the original GN prediction, and therefore they are necessary. Then we take the harmonic mean of PNPS value uh, to measure the overall performance of the ex explanations. We call it FNS value. Um, these are the data sets we used in the evaluation. Uh, these three marked uh, data sets are ground, uh, have ground truth explanations, while others do not have ground truth explanations. Um, they cover some web ac applications and some examples from chemicals and some synthetic data sets. Uh, we create this metric to evaluate the explanations no matter with or without ground truth data. We can see the overall performance of our method and some baseline methods. The improvement on the FNS score is significant. And more importantly, we observe that the factual reasoning based methods commonly have higher PS score, which means they are more sufficient. And the counterfactual reasoning based method commonly has um, higher PN score, um, which means they are more necessary. This is in line with our initial motivation of combining the both uh, perspectives into one algorithm. Uh, and we also do ground truth based evaluation on the three data sites that have accessible ground truth explanations. And uh, besides, we use two non parametric methods, Kanda's tall value and the Spearman's raw value, to test the, uh, the correlation between the performance on ground truth evaluation and the PNPS based evaluation. The results show that they are highly, positive, uh, they are highly positively correlated. This is important since for a data set without uh, ground truth motifs, if one explanation method out outperforms another one according to our PNPS based evaluation, then we can have a good confidence to expect the same conclusion if using traditional evaluation metrics, um, assuming ground truth is available. So that for future research on explain explainable genes, um, they have a chance to evaluate their method on the data sets that do not have ground truth data. So that's basically a huge contribution of this work. Um, we also try to play with the balance between how much we consider factual reasoning and how much we consider counterfactual reasoning. We can easily say that um, if we consider both of them, no matter more counterfactual or more factual reasoning, the performance is commonly better than only consider one of them. And this also justifies the idea in the paper. Uh, okay, these are what I'd like to talk about in the presentation. Uh, for more details, you are welcome to refer to our paper. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for, for, for being here. Um, we have 
few minutes to take perhaps two or three questions. You can add them to the chat or this being a regular Zoom environment, you could just put your hand up or, or unmute yourself with or without camera to ask questions. While you think about this, um, let me just perhaps take a step back and, 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 and ask one general question, uh, Jantal. So, so you mentioned at the beginning that um, the work um, is, 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 is relevant to, to, to the web um, because um, the web is, is, um, is an environment has lots of graph data. Right. So yes. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit um, on, on, on this framing, just to um, especially or, or given the, the data sets that you have used in the in the evaluation. Would that be OK? Oh, uh, yes. In this paper, I use a citation uh, data set. So uh -huh. which uh, talk about the rich paper set another paper and the, the relationship between the authors. So it's kind uh -huh. of graph like web data. And uh -huh. uh, um, uh, I can, uh, so we can train a graph neural network to predict a paper, the domain of a paper. We, we have six different uh, domains, like from chemical or from uh, computer science, and we can predict. And then we can explain why this paper is in the computer science domain. The explanation could be age-based. Uh, because uh, such as this paper cite another paper and uh, that paper is from the CS uh, domain. And also it can based on the feature, like this uh, is basically NLP features, like this paper mentions algorithm, mentions graph, mentions neural networks, something like that. So this is the actual data site I'm using in the paper. And uh, we can also use uh, the online streaming data, such as I know a Reddit data set. Uh, mm -hmm. It has a uh, people reply to another people in the stream. And uh, you can predict that like this, uh, um, this text is the question or the answer, something like that. And that can also be explainable with this method. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, thank yeah. you, that's yeah. great. Um, and then, then a follow on question about, about this, um, about the design of the, of the um, reasoning framework. So, so you mentioned um, that you would prefer, I think you call them simple, but strong explanations. Would you mind yes. elaborating a little bit more on the intuition behind that? Why, why this preference? Oh, uh, so uh, the first uh, thing I'd like to mention is, uh, when I see uh, uh, explanation is strong, it has a threshold, such as uh, if one explanation is over some threshold, like in this paper, it satisfies some conditions, then this explanation is strong enough. But for the complexity, it's, it's like more like a continuous value. Uh, we always seek to uh, seek a simple explanation, such as if, if, if I can use one sentence to explain a, a science problem, then I wouldn't use two sentences uh, if the explanation can satisfy the students, something like that. So uh, it's based on the outcomes reader principle. We always choose the simpler one if they are both strong. That's the um, kind of the intuitive. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah, and we can, uh, uh, so I define the complexity as just simply as the size of the graph. Uh, but we can use different methods to design it. We can design the complexity as uh, as our own metric, and also uh, for the uh, for the strengths, we can use different threshold. It depends on the user. But uh, the whole point is we minimize the complexity with some when we reach some threshold. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.